thank you so much, and thank you so much to, to uh, Pinto Iraya for having me. Pinto Iraya has been a constant inspiration for me for several years, so it's a very uh, happy evening for me to be here to present for you. So um, I would like to show you mainly three films, my three latest films, Bergen, Zola, and Little Boy, and I would like to sort of open up my files of uh, the process uh, and research. So um, I will try to take you through uh, the lines of thoughts that brought me to the results. So I came into filmmaking and gravitating toward the abstraction right after school. Uh, this was uh, my uh, master thesis uh, film. It was uh, a sort of a poetry film and it clicked with other festivals and other poets and authors. Zombien kjennetegnes av sin enfoldige glaning, sin nasale røst og begrensede ordforråd, sin hang. I like the idea that you have just seen a film about zombies, but you have not seen any zombies there. So that sort of is something that also followed me through the work, that if you take sort of the main thing out, then uh, the brain will start working for you and, and, uh, and place it there. So that's how I sort of came to do short films. Some of them are centered around typography, but mainly I try to do them abstract. And one of the reasons is that while in school I was talking to a literature professor who said this sounds like a nice idea but remember that not every author is guaranteed to be happy that you are placing images on their text. So I thought mm -hmm, well, what if I just placed the images a bit of, on the side from the text. So eventually they became more and more abstract. Men orkestret var det største i sitt slag og spilte uhyre presist. I said for this talk I would talk about hits and misses and um, I would like to just share with you one miss. So this is a, a poem by uh, poet Alan Nøttvedt. It's called Nordangsdalen in Norwegian. That is the valley of the Nordang. And Alan has a very a uh, specific way of reading his text. It's almost like a song, so I knew I had to sort of focus on his voice. Nordangsdalen is uh, up in the mountains in the middle of Norway. It's very steep, it's very narrow, and it is notorious for its frequent avalanches and rock slides. And in 1912, there was a huge rock slide, and it became a dam for the river running through the dams. So, I knew where I was going with this. It's now a popular place for divers. So I knew, okay, this is about nature, about water, about forces. And I was trying to just find some way to boil down the graphics into the simplest shapes, taking inspiration from what is already there in art history. So, okay, I can take down all of these simplest shapes and try to match them with how he talks, where he puts pressure on words, and where he draws his breath. In a case of uh, hybris, I thought, I don't think I need to plan this anymore. I think I've got everything I need, so I'll just start. And this is how it came to be, and see if you can spot where I gave up. De dammet dal, de dimmet dagen, vi danste arketypes grunt alle bål. No. So, here I said, okay, you have absolutely no direction here. Um, there were people waiting for this film. It was supposed to be sort of announced at uh, a poetry reading. So I just gave up and it was really, really nice. Tomorrow, I'll, I'll have a good sleep now. Tomorrow I'll call everyone and say, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Maybe it will come in a few weeks. So that sort of just everything just released and I had a beautiful sleep. And in the morning, right before I had to sort of call everyone and say what's going on, I thought, wait a minute, what if I just try one more thing? And then I gave one square a very specific path to move along to a sound. It was the sound of a bird chirping, and that sort of did it. I finished it in time. D. 
di dammet dal, di dimmet dagen, vidans arketypisk grunt alle bål, natten før di dammet dal, her skulle aldrig være sjø. Men gress kan svømme, mose kan svømme, sommerfugl svømme, trær kan svømme. And you can find all these films in the Gospedal Animert. The poetry films from Gospedal that sort of started the whole thing up. After a few years of doing this, I started working at Microfilm and they have now produced three of my most production heavy short films. Uh, Bagan, Little Boy and uh, the latest Zolle. Uh, at Microfilm, I also, we do some work for films and short films. We uh, illustrate music in a documentary, or this is a title sequence for a true crime series. So that's how we make a living. Now I'll move over to the Boig. This short is a visual music piece. The music, it's by um, Eric Hedin, who composes uh, music and sound design for stage uh, plays. And there was a stage play of Per Gint, where he composed the music and took the famous Edvard Grieg music for that play and searched through the music to find elements that he thought he could extract and play around with it. So he chopped it up into little pieces and took out what he wanted and then he reassembled it digitally. So he recomposed everything into sort of a Hedin Grieg Frankenstein. The Boig, the La Grande Courbe, Der Große Krumme. It's a famous word now and that is because of Henry Gibson's play. The word itself comes from Old Norse, from Baugr, meaning ring, something that is curved. And in some instances, it refers to serpent or snake. If we look up in the dictionary now, it's an invisible being perceived as a giant serpent. And it is now integrated into the Norwegian language as, an, as a normal word, a normal expression, uh, describing something that hinders you from achieving your goal or something that is hard to get through. So it was first recorded as a myth or a fairy tale by Peter Christian Asbjörnsen in 1848. And he came upon this story about a person who supposedly lived in the 1600s. He was a hunter in the mountains and he found a cabin. It was pitch dark and there was something there that he couldn't quite touch it or get to it. But it was always there when he tried to lay down or sit down. He said, who is there? And it replied, I am the boig. Henry Gibson saw the symbolic value of this and he integrated this into the epic poem Per Gynt. And that is traveling the world since it was created. In very, very short, we follow Per Gynt his whole life and he leads a fantastical life, but each time he is presented with a choice that is uh, defining his character then he goes the other way. So he never takes those choices. So he has just been in living with the trolls. He's drinking their beer, eating their food, laughing at their jokes. And then they say, well, I think we need to sort of alter you a little bit so you can stay a troll forever. And then he says, mm -mm -mm. yeah, no, it was, it was fun. Thank you. And then he runs away and everything crashes and the trolls hunt him down through in the caves in the mountains. And then he finds himself in the pitch dark. So. He can be heard flailing and slashing about, and he says, Oh, who are you? What's there? Answer me, I am myself. Stand aside. Go up round about, Per, for the fells are all wide. Who are you? I am myself. Can you say the like? Who are you? Myself. And this sort of goes over and over. What are you? I'm the mighty boig. Ah, hooray! The riddle was black and now it's grey. He's not dead, not alive, something slimy, fog-like, no shape. It's like meeting a number of half-awake bears as they snarl from their slumber. Yeah, it ends with him just losing his mind. Uh, there's nothing concrete for him to hold on to. So he starts biting himself and clawing himself. This is Per uh, caught in the ring and there is no secret that Per is here fighting himself. So as a very popular story and character, it has, of course, been uh, visualized in many ways before. 
This is more uh, an illustration from the old fairy tale where he actually sort of picks up a gun and shoots this fog-like serpent thing in the head. Again, from the myth, this is Turmerisse, depicting the boy more uh, sort of as a clump of dirt, no shape or form there either. I especially like this one. This is from the um, uh, Per Gint stage play from which the music was composed, where the actor playing Per Gint is standing alone on the stage and having this whole conversation by himself. And there's two strobe lights on him, so he has two shadows shifting while he is performing that conversation. This is a more traditional uh, rendition of it, where Per is sort of overcome by a uh, rolling fog. A closer rendition by Guy Moon, where he sort of, you can see he's still wearing the troll's tail. They pinched on his butt on the way out of the mountain. Uh, the abstract dark is starting to take more shape of uh, serpents. Theodor Kittelsen thought it more like a troll, even though it's sort of invisible, no shape there. And Paul Gauguin has an interesting version of it, where he sort of renders a more sort of a collective boy, that people are working together to finally get the beast down. So with all these inputs, I, was, I started trying to visualize. So what can the boy be in simple graphics? Is it something that disturbs what is straight and makes it crooked? Is it something that takes up space? and squeezes the air out of the room? Is it something standing in front of you, blocking the way, weighing several tons? Is it something hiding in the dark? So this is me just testing it towards the music. So um, trying to, to illustrate meeting resistance, for example. <laughs> Other times I try to sort of find how to, to visualize uh, certain instruments. This is uh, me trying to hang on to the pizzicato. I've drawn them or animated them uh, in After Effects, black on white, and then doing it negative again. So, and this is how it looks. Um, I animated this first in After Effects with simple vector uh, shapes, and then I printed it out on paper, uh, frame by frame, and then scanned them back in again. But I was very happy to, to let all the small differences in from image to image make it look a little alive. So I did this uh, with several uh, graphics. This is about shifting, something sort of coiling away from you, or just there's no end, there's no beginning, you can't sort of grasp it. Print it out and scan back in, try to combine, trying to find some way of composing. I was uh, very intrigued by the idea that the ring and the serpent biting its tail is a symbol that sort of popped up uh, thousands of years ago uh, in different cultures all over the planet. Fighting the serpent and serpentine carvings go back thousands of years too. And of course, whenever I have time to go out and do some research physically and uh, do a little recording and bring with me home. This is where I sort of take out Try to find some idea of the snake, and there we have it, full circle. Uh, that's where the circle is from. three filmmakers to take a portion of an opera uh, score and place uh, images to this. Zolle is written and composed by uh, Du Yun. It's about uh, a woman who is deceased 
she does not sort of find the way into the afterlife and she's not finding any consolation in this limbo and she keeps clinging on and just feels like a refugee in the afterlife as well so uh, this part of the story is called resign so this is where she as a restless spirit she sort of just gives up and she disintegrates into the ether uh, except for her heart which becomes a glowing fossil in the ground. I thought, okay, I, what if I sort of take some inspiration from traditional ancient Chinese illustration like this? Bada Chandran here, uh, do you n uh, mention him herself as an inspiration for her work? And I like the way he's using open space, the counter space, to fill the composition. And also the, the idea of paper texture was uh, intriguing for me. I also come back to the Ligeti Vehing articulation, the, the graphic notation, joining along with the sounds and the music. I want to do looping. I think it fits for a limbo and it fits for loneliness, I think, that you always go around and you come back to where you started and you don't get anywhere. And try to use open spaces, the void that she is lost in, uh, and work with typography as good as I can. But most importantly, I wanted to sort of have fun with the phonotrope to make the loop. This is an earlier research trying to teach myself how to use the phonotrope. Because once I found out this was possible, it just blew my brain out. I created a series of loops for the resuprint. I wanted the resuprint because of the very, very nice grainy gradients. Those gray clouds, my teardrops missed. This is from the process where I'm sort of searching for how much of the text should I use, how much typography should there be in this film. What you see here is a designer getting lost in all the opportunities. But what I did find eventually uh, was to, to trust more in the concept of uh, the looping. And that was a nice revelation. Little boy, it's about a nuclear bomb. Specifically about this nuclear bomb. This is the first bomb that was used on humans. Uh, it was dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. Little boy was three meters long, weighed three tons, and it fell for about 44 seconds before detonating. Uh, Hiroshima is a river city, it lies close to the coast and the river is a delta and it's a large city. There's a million people living there now. In the summer in Japan there are hundreds of thousands of cicadas in the trees and everywhere and they have a very distinct sound. This looks like an anonymous side street but it has one very important plaque right here. It says that this is the hypo center. The nuclear bomb Little Boy detonated 500 meters directly above this point. So it was just very dizzying standing there and looking straight up into the air and thinking that this is where it happened. Right next to this uh, point lies the atomic bomb dome. This was the only building standing after the detonation, mostly because it was directly under the bomb. So the pressure came in a right angle. So instead of just laying it down, it just peeled it from the inside. This is the view from my hotel room window. And here you see the atomic bomb dome. And um, if I can guess what 500 meters is, it's uh, around here. Uh, on the plaque there, it says that uh, we are a collective of survivors. Our mission is to collect artwork from people who were eyewitnesses. The red dot there, it's a person who says, I was five years old and 17 kilometers away. But on the other side there, there's a person saying, I was about 20 kilometers away when I saw the red circle on the sky. Um, and also, of course, the cloud coming after. That is little boy, in the second it detonates. 
suddenly uh, there exists a nuclear fireball. Uh, this one was 300 meters in diameter, and it had a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees Celsius, which is the surface temperature of the sun. visuals there are uh, made in a petri dish and is a liquid dynamics. Most of it is uh, household products like milk or uh, oil and soap with some other stuff I found along the way. And when I had enough of them I could sort of chop them up and place them into different scenes like this. I was also very intrigued by the idea of something this small that is happening within one squared centimeter can be perceived as something very large and very powerful. You have these worlds which are happening in my petri dish, but it's also sort of the same patterns that you can see in space, in galaxies and in uh, nebulas. And uh, this is the first test of something coming up from behind the circle. This is just a cup of hot water and some lighting. Uh, I'm just trying to combine these together to see if I can do a menacing orb or a circle. For the fog, for the smoky thing there later, that is dry ice. The sound designer. Sven Jakobsen is so extremely important for this film to have the character that it has. And in the finale there, that is actual film burning. Uh, we went to the Cinematheque in Oslo and tried to film right into the projection window. Uh, but mostly uh, we found filming the screen worked a bit better. And um, I think I'll uh, leave you there with a Norwegian uh, thanks for me. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>